Hello, good evening everybody and welcome to Wednesday Night Live Bible Study. I'm Jarrell Cummings, the pastor of the Freedom Center right here in beautiful Wesley Chapel, Florida, just north of Tampa, literally like a few blocks north of Tampa. So you could say the Tampa area, all of Tampa Bay actually. So we're so glad you're here. We're so glad you're a part of service tonight. We love you and we thank God for your lives. I'm so glad you're prioritizing your hearing the word of God. Remember we talked about that last Wednesday night about uh, putting an emphasis on hearing the word of God, never underestimating the power of hearing God's word. So I had a wonderful time with you last Wednesday night and I'm looking forward to this evening, to being with you and to spending Wednesday uh, evening with you a few minutes uh, this evening. And I believe it's going to be life transforming tonight. And uh, that's what the word will do. It's a seed. It, God's word is a seed. And the moment it enters into your heart, it starts producing life. And so uh, we're just so thankful that you are looking away from all of the things that could be a distraction to you right now. And you're putting an emphasis on your time with God in the word of God. Amen. Well, I want to welcome all of you who are watching us online. Of course, I want to welcome our online audience, everybody who is tuning in uh, from across Wesley Chapel and, and Tampa and uh, let's see, Texas and uh, New Jersey and New York. I think we have people in Jamaica. Um, so all of you wonderful people who are watching us from wherever you are watching us from, go ahead and say hello to us. Tell us your name and tell us where you're tuning in from. And we are so glad to welcome you in tonight. We'll give you uh, some shout outs and acknowledge the people who are coming in and thank God for all of you. Of course, this will be aired tomorrow night at 7 p.m. That's our new airtime. So just a couple of quick updates. Our new airtime is always going to be uh, 7 p.m. So, so Monday's message, Sunday's uh, service, su the Sunday morning service will be aired Monday at 7 p.m. on YouTube. And uh, if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the notification bell. And... Um, you will get notified when we are streaming live. Amen. Um, also, Wednesday nights, of course, they stream live here on my Facebook. Um, so make sure you're following me or we're friends. Send me a friend request if we're not. Um, but uh, tomorrow, Thursday at 7 p.m., uh, Wednesday night's messages will be live every Thursday at 7 p.m. So again, make sure you're subscribed and click the uh, notification bell so that you are aware of all the, uh, the, the content that we are uh, making available uh, to you and, and, and to your family. All right. So I'm excited, excited, excited to be on tonight. I think it's going to be a real blessing of the Lord. Hello to everybody joining and everybody that's being a part of the service. So good to see you all tonight. I want to talk to you tonight about some things that we brought up on Sunday. And I want to use this opportunity Wednesday night to show you some things to validate um, and just to assure your heart on some of the truths uh, that we were bringing forth. We were really making some strong points about the fact that God doesn't focus on our sins. He doesn't, um, he doesn't look at them and deal with us according to our sins. And we use an example of Sarah and Abraham. I mean, these are two people uh, who are prominent, prominent figures in the Bible. In fact, without Abraham and Sarah, we couldn't be born again because Jesus is the seed of Abraham. Physically, his physical descent is from Abraham. Uh, and uh, we, the Bible says Jesus went to the cross so that we could enjoy everything that God promised Abraham. And so Abraham is a very, very prominent figure in the Bible as well as his wife. These are two prominent figures. And yet these people were not perfect. Massive, massive failures. Uh, things that, um, you know, you would not look at these people and think, well, no, these are... Uh, qualified people for God to use. Well, the truth is none of us 
are qualified. And that's what I want to encourage you with tonight to let you know uh, that God loves you and he's not asking you to have all your ducks in, in order, to have all your T's crossed and all your I's dotted because it's impossible to do that. What he's asking you is to just simply live before him, trust him and allow him to flow through you. And here's the good news. You are going to make mistakes. You're going to have weak moments. You're going to have times where you, um, it seems like you falter. You're going to have times where you doubt. You say, Jarrell, what do you mean? Well, these are all the things that we, we saw with Abraham and Sarah. And you're going to have these times. And, and guess what? God is sticking with you through all of that. He's finding the good in all of that. He's never going to leave you. He's patient with you. And together, you and him are going to get the job done. And I want you to know, don't quit. Don't think you've disqualified yourself. Don't think, well, I've done too many things wrong and now God could never use me. That is not true. Don't think I've closed too many doors that he has opened and there are no more doors left for me to walk through. That is not true. If you close the door through a poor decision or a poor uh, choice that you made, whether it was yesterday or yesteryear, God is able to open a new door for you and no man can close that door. And I'm letting you know that your future is bright. And yes, we have failures and yes, we have mistakes and yes, we have made some poor choices, but God is greater than those choices and God is even greater than our sin. Now to say uh, what we're saying is vitally important for you to understand, but please don't misunderstand. We're not saying to make poor choices. We're not saying uh, to go down the wrong path. We're not saying to go out and live a lifestyle of sin. No, that's not what we're saying at all. But what we are saying, it is true that you are going to make mistakes. You are going to, to, to have some bad choices in your life out of ignorance many times. And many times it's just we make poor choices sometimes, but you need to know that God is with you. So I want to deal with this tonight, this question, does God see my sins? Now that is a ve that, that, that's a very, very important question. You know why? Because we all have sins. If we all have sins in our lives, er to sin means simply you just missed the mark. Well, if we all have areas in our lives where we are missing the mark, then it is vitally important for me to know is God inspecting those sins? Is God uh, seeing my, my sins? Well, let's answer that question tonight. I want to just answer it directly, and then I'm going to show you something in the Bible, okay? Because if I don't show you this in the Bible, you're going to think that, you know what, man, this is, this is too good to be true. But it's not. It is the truth. And it's because God is so good. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Here's the question. Does God see my sins? The question is, yes, he does see your sins. But he does not factor them in. He does not account for them in his dealing with you. So God is not focused. A better way to say it is God is not focused on your sins or he's not factoring your sins in as he deals with you. Now, we're going to explain all of this so you can understand why that's so. Of course, God isn't blind. He sees everything we do. He sees the, uh, the choices that we make that are in line with his will. He sees the choices that we make that are not in line with his will. And of course, if you're making choices that are not in line with his will, stop it and start making choices that are in line with his will. But the truth is we are going to make choices that are not in line with his will. Well, does God use those against us? Does he factor that in in his dealing with us? Is God 
uh, seeing my sin. Well, let me just show you something in the Bible. And before we read this, I want to quote to you 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. And really, uh, you really should read verse, uh, chap 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 through 11, because it really sets the context. But I'll summarize it for you right now. Uh, here, Paul is telling the church at Corinth, he's letting them know that everything that happened to Israel from the time they came out of Egypt un until they reached the promised land is an example for us today of how God is dealing with us, of how God uh, moves in relationship with us today. There are types and there are uh, pictures, wonderful truths in there of how God deals with us, such as uh, how did God bring Israel out of Egypt? Well, he brought them out by the blood of the Passover lamb. There were 10 plagues. Of course, none of the nine previous plagues worked. Only the 10th one did. And you know what it was. It was the blood of the Passover lamb. And of course, Jesus is our Passover lamb. Behold, the lamb of God, John chapter one, which takes away the sin of the world. He did that with his blood. And so there are wonderful truths today of how God deals with us through Christ. Now, I'm going to take you and show you an instance where Israel is in the wilderness and they have sin. There's no doubt about it that there is sin and there is failure. But yet God himself says that he doesn't see it in the sense that he doesn't use that against them. He still flows in their life in spite of their failures. Does he see it? Is he aware of it? Is he conscious of it? Of course. Does he know that they have failed? Of course, but he doesn't see it or he doesn't account for it in his dealings with them. So go with me if you have a Bible. This will be good for you to see this because um, I don't want you to take my word for granted that these things are in the Bible. But look with me at Numbers 23, Numbers 23. And you're going to see some awesome, awesome things here that I think are going to help you. All right. So Numbers 23, there's a guy that uh, maybe you're familiar with him. His name is Balaam. His name is Balaam. And, uh, and Balaam is a, he's a prophet, um, but he's, uh, he's not a legitimate prophet. He has some semblance of a relationship with God, and it, it is evident that God did use him to some degree, but he's not a legitimate prophet. Even in the New Testament, actually, uh, he's spoken of uh, in two places in the New Testament, and he's actually, uh, he's actually used in a negative sense, as if to say, uh, don't follow this example if you are a minister. We won't get into that part tonight. So here, Balaam is still kind of good. He's still kind of doing things the right way to a degree, but he, uh, he has a prophecy for Israel, and of course, they are symbolic. They're emblematic of the church today. And so notice what, uh, what, 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 what happens in this story. Here's King Balak, and he hires uh, this prophet Balaam to come and curse God's people. And so he brings him up to this mountain, and he actually brings him to three different locations. So this is the second location. He brings him up, and he says, hey, I want you to get a really good view of Israel. Now, why does he want him to get a good view? Well, it's symbolic. You know, he's high up on this mountain and what can he see? Everything. And sometimes we kind of feel like, well, if God really knew everything that I was doing, would he still treat me the same way? We kind of feel like, well, God, God knows, God sees, but there are things that we what? We try to hide from him. We try to keep from him. We don't talk to him about the addiction we're dealing with. We don't talk to him about the lust that may be brewing in our heart for our coworker, our colleague. We don't talk to him about some of the things that we are thinking, the thoughts of failure, defeat, the fears that we have. And so, yes, we know that he's God, but many times we, we, um, we're distant in our relationship with him. And so here's Balaam coming up high and he can see all, all the things that you try to hide, the crevices, the things that 
you know, you put under the rock that you don't want anyone to know about. So here's Balaam really high and he can see everything, all of Israel, all the good, we would say, all the bad and what? All the ugly. So he can see all of it. And so Balak tells Balaam, I want you to curse these people. And maybe if you see everything about them, it will justify God cursing them. And so Balaam gets up to the top of this mountain. And when he's on the top of this mountain, the spirit of the Lord comes on him. That anointing falls on him. And the Bible says that God put a word in Balaam's mouth. And he says these words. He says, God is not a man that he should lie. Many of you know that verse. You quote it. That God is not a man that he should lie. Nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said something? And will he not do it? Has he promised something? And will he fail to make good on it? Now we know, we know that verse, but we don't know the context of which God said that statement in. And the reason he made that statement that he is not a man, he never tells lies, whatever he says is absolutely true. The reason that he makes that statement is because of the verses that follow. And the verses that follow, if God didn't make that statement, we would think in our own minds, God, you're lying about it. <laughs> there is no way that this can be true. Now, we probably wouldn't verbalize that. I understand you respect God. You probably wouldn't verbalize that or call God a liar. I, I, I hear you. But I'm saying in your heart, in your mind, in your thinking, you would think to yourself, this isn't true. This, this isn't true. This is some weird interpretation that some preacher is putting on this. But there is no way that this could be true about God. Because God sees everything that I've done and God don't like ugly. <laughs> and, you know, you've been ugly. But my brother, and my sister, it is true. God doesn't like ugly. But the truth is that Jesus is beautiful. He's the fairest among 10,000. He's altogether lovely. And guess where you are? You're in Christ. And because you're in Christ today, washed by his blood, clothed in his beauty, God sees you beautiful. You're his bride. He has presented you to himself without a spot, without a wrinkle or any such thing. You are perfectly holy, perfectly righteous, and without fault before him. That's the Bible. And yes, have we failed? Yes. Have we made mistakes? Yes. Do we wish that we could have some do-overs? Both hands, all of us have both hands up, right? But the truth is, because of what Jesus has done, God deals with you. He loved, do you know the Bible actually says in Corinthians that uh, he says that you are a beautiful fragrance to God because you're in Jesus. Do you know that you smell good to God? Just think about, you know, some of you ladies and, and brothers like to do this. There's some men who like to do this, too. But you, you like to, you know, uh, smell the flowers. You like to go to botanical gardens and smell the fragrances. You ladies wear things on yourselves to enhance yourselves when you go out in the public. Do you know uh, that you God loves being in your presence? There's nothing about you that is. Um, off putting to God. Nothing. God loves you perfectly. And he finds no fault in you. 
And so I want you to see this. So he, he, he says, watch this, Numbers 23 and verse 18. I'm going to read it to you. If you have a Bible, that's great. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. Just hear what I'm going to say because I want you to know that it's in the Bible. And so he says, verse 16, And the Lord met Balaam, and he put a word in his mouth. So the words that Balaam is getting ready to speak are not Balaam's. These are the words of God. And they're talking about you. Now watch this, verse 17, And when he came to him, behold, he stood by the burnt offering, and the prince of Moab with him, and Balak said unto him, What has the Lord spoken? And he took up this parable, and he said, Rise up, Balak, and hear. I say to you tonight, I say to all of you tonight who are listening, Rise up and hear. You know, there's something about the word of God that enables us to rise up. But it's not just any word of God. It's the good news. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the good news of His love and of all that He has done for us through the burnt offering, His Son. Do you notice where they were standing? Where Balaam and Balak were standing? By the burnt offering. You see, because of what Jesus has done, what does the burnt offering speak of? God's wrath and God's judgment, the fire of God, the indignation of God, the anger of God fell on Jesus. There is no anger. There's no wrath. There's no judgment for you today, period. And so he says, rise up, Balak, and hear. Hearken to me, you son of Zippor. Verse 19. Now, this is the verse we know. A lot of us know this. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent or change his mind. To repent means to change the, the way you think. You know, God doesn't have to change his mind about you. And let me say this. There's nothing you have done that has changed God's mind, God's good opinion of you. Man, you know, I was reading uh, the other night, I was reading, I don't know if it was the night or the morning, but um, I was reading where he says in, in, uh, in Romans 8, he says, and he, he called us in Christ and he, 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 he planned for us to... Uh, or excuse me, he, he called us in Christ, he made us righteous, and he glorified us. The King James says, who he justified, that means to make righteous, he glorified. The word glory there, it literally means to have a good opinion of. Do you know that God has a good opinion of you? And there's nothing you can do about it. You say, Drell, well, you don't know what I've done or the decisions that I've made or you don't know my past. You're just now meeting me and you only see me one hour a week or two. You know, in our church, it's not one hour, but, you know, I'd like to say it. But, you know, you, 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 <laughs> you, you only know you only see me for a couple of hours a week. You don't know what I'm doing. That's true. I don't. But I don't need to know. What you need to know. Is that there's nothing you're doing or have done or will ever do that will change the good opinion that he has of you. God loves you. He loves you more than you know. He loves you more than you can understand. Hallelujah. All right, look at this. Notice what he says. He says, uh, so God is not a man that he should lie. Now, why does he make this statement? Why does he say 
Listen, whenever God says something, he's not lying about it. You know, here's Balaam and Balak standing there. And Balaam says, listen, Balak, hear me now. What God says isn't a lie. Now, why is he saying this? Because Balak just asked him, well, what has the Lord said to you? What did God say about Israel? What did God say about his people? So Balaam responds. He says, all right, listen now. What I'm getting ready to tell you, it's not a lie. Neither can you get God to change his mind about the statements he's getting ready to make. That's what the word repent means. All right, now watch this. Whew. Verse 20. Behold, I have received commandment to bless. He has blessed and I cannot reverse it. Why? Verse 21. Because he has not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither has he seen perverseness in Israel. You know what Balaam is saying here? He says, I've received a command from God. I've received orders. These people are blessed and it's irreversible. There is nothing that can change their position of being blessed by God. And Balak says, well, why? And Balaam says, because God does not behold sin, iniquity in his people. It didn't say that they didn't have sin. He said, God isn't looking at their sins. He's not beholding their sins. He's not factoring their sins in when it comes to his decision to bless you. Neither does he behold anything that they have done that is perverted. God is not looking at any of that to determine whether or not he will bless them. But there's only one thing he sees. There's only one thing he hears. And Balaam goes on to say, look at this. He says, God is with them. And there is a shout of a king among them. What's the shout? of the king that's among them. At this time, Israel has no king. Their first king was Saul and that doesn't come until 1 Samuel. This is hundreds of years prior to them ever having a king. They're not even in the promised land yet or even established as a nation or a kingdom yet. Yet God says they have a king while they're still in the wilderness. Who's their king? And what is the shout? Well, every time in the Bible, the term shouting is used. It's used to refer to victory. A victory that has been won. And who has won that victory? Their king. Who's our king? Who is the king of kings? Jesus. You know what God says? He says the victory of Jesus is so loud to me that I can't focus on anything else except what my son has done for them. And there is nothing they can do that can ring louder in my ears. There's nothing they can do that can outdo what my son has done for them. And because of what my son has done for them, 
there's nothing else I can see. There's nothing else more important to me to focus on. There's nothing else that has my attention more than the perfect work of their king, Jesus. And I'm telling you today that in spite of your and my perverseness, wickedness, sin, failure, mistakes, any of those words that resonate with you, the moment you put your faith in Jesus, the moment you put your faith in the blood of Christ, you say, Jarrell, well, that was 20 years ago. And I've made very, very, very bad decisions since then. The blood of Jesus There's a constant flow of the blood of Jesus every day on you. It is literally in the presence of God right now before the mercy seat speaking on your behalf. The Bible says in Hebrews 12 that the blood of Jesus is speaking for you better things than what the blood of Abel spoke. And most people don't understand that. But Abel uh, and Cain, that was the first murder. And that is a capital offense. That is sin to the max. And the Bible says that the blood of Abel was, was crying out, demanding for a curse to come on Cain. So with that mindset, the book of Hebrews, Paul writes to the church and he says, Jesus' blood has been spilled just like Abel's blood was spilled. And Jesus' blood is crying out. It's demanding, not for a curse, but for better things. What are the better things? Blessing. There's a shout of a king in your life that is far louder than your failures. And God has not seen. He is not beholding iniquity in you. He is not seeing perverseness in you. Why? Because the shout of your king. And where did Jesus win this victory? Look at verse 22. God brought them out of Egypt. Well, how did he bring them out of Egypt? By the blood of the Passover lamb. You know where Jesus won this victory? You know where the shout of our king was done? At the cross where his blood was spilled. And that blood is covering the doorpost of your life. And it is blocking access to the curse. I need you to believe that. I need you to believe that. You know, it's funny. Um, he says, I can't reverse anything God has done. I can't change it. The blessing on your life is irreversible. But there is something that can stop the blessing. That can open you up to the things that you don't want to see, that you don't want to experience. You say, Jarrell, what is it? Well, look, look I'm going to show you something. I'll, I'll kind of talk you through this. But if we kept reading, you would go into chapter 24. Of course, this is 23. But in chapter 24, verse 1, it says that Balak saw that God was determined or pleased. He was set on blessing his people. You could read that in 24, verse 1. So when Balak realized that there was nothing he could do to get God to repent or to change his mind regarding the good plans that he had for his people, you know, God has no bad plans for you. His thoughts toward you are good and not evil. His thoughts toward you are filled with nothing but how he can bless you and your house. So when Balak saw that there was nothing that God, he saw God was stubborn, that God was uh, set, settled, Established, determined, 
please. It brought, it actually would bring God pleasure to bless his people. When he saw this, you know what he did? We're not going to read all of 24. I've got to let you go tonight. But if, if you can read this on your own and also you can reference it in the New Testament as well. Uh, I think Jude discusses it and um, I think Peter as well. But if you, if you read this, if you keep reading the chapter, what actually happens is um, Balaam tells Balak, he says, there's nothing you can do to change God's mind, but here's what you could do. Now, here's where Balaam really messed up. And this is bad. But he actually told Balak how to defeat them. And he said, if you get them to change their God, if you get them to start worshiping other gods, you can defeat them. You say, well, how does that apply to us today? I don't have an idol in my backyard. I'm not worshiping another god. Well, let me say this to you. Are you believing another Jesus? Are you believing another Jesus that's different from the Bible? Are you believing another gospel different from the gospel of the scripture? What I'm sharing with you is the gospel and what we're always sharing. The good news of Jesus, what has been done for you in Christ. But if you believe wrongly about God or about what has been done for you in Christ, if you believe wrong, then you can open yourself up to things that you don't want to experience. And that's what chapter 24 in Numbers is, is primarily about. When Paul, it's very interesting, Paul writes to the church and he says, he says, are you believing another gospel? Are you believing another Jesus? And then he pronounces a double curse on anybody who preaches a different gospel than the gospel he preached. You know what Paul preached? I want you to see this in the Bible. This goes right along with what we just read here about Balaam, how God doesn't behold sin in his people. Go to uh, 2 Corinthians 5. You all know this chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and notice what he says. He says, verse 19, he says, To wit, that God was in Christ, reconcil reconciling the world to himself, look at this, not imputing their trespasses unto them. The word impute there, there means to account. God is not accounting your sins as he deals with you. This is what Paul preached. Exactly what we just showed you today where he said God is not beholding your sin. Paul preached that God, verse 19, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. God was in Christ reconciling, meaning settling the account. You had a sin balance. Jesus paid it. Jesus reconciled your account. God is not sending any bills to your house of payment due. None. He was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Look at this. Not imputing their sins unto them. And he has committed to us what word? The word of reconciliation. What does it mean to reconcile? It means your account balance has been settled. There is zero balance. There is no creditor. There is no bad credit uh, uh, report on your behalf. There is nothing negative coming to you unless you don't believe this word of reconciliation. And that's what Balak got Israel to do. He got them to exchange the true God of Israel with a, with a, with, with a fake God. And today you might not be going uh, into a temple or into a shrine or you might not be having idols in your home or 
or whatever it is. But are you believing the gospel truth? And what is the gospel truth? He goes on to say, he says, verse 21, for God made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, not in yourself. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You say, Drell, I haven't done anything righteous. How could God see me righteous? Look at what I've done. You don't know what I do. I know what Jesus has done. And the Bible says that Jesus never sinned right here. We just read it. Verse 21. He knew no sin, yet he was made sin for you. Likewise, you may not be doing things right. But you have been made right. Jesus didn't do any acts of sin to be made sin. But yet the Bible, the, I'm reading to you right here. The Bible is saying that he knew no sin. He did not know and he did not commit any sin. Yet he was made sin. Likewise, you may not be committing any works of righteousness. But if your faith is in Jesus and you are truly born again, you have been made the righteousness of God. And God is not dealing with you after your sins. He is not beholding sin in you. The only thing he hears, the only thing he's focused on, the only thing he sees is the victory of what Jesus has done. The blood of the Lord. You, you're living under that blood right now. And you are cleansed from all unrighteousness. Period. First John chapter 1 says that when we confess Jesus as our Lord, the blood of his son cleanses us from all. All means all. All unrighteousness. I want you to believe that today. You say, Jarrell, why do I need to believe that? Because of what I just read to you. He put in the context of Numbers 23... God was determined to bless his people and that blessing was irreversible. But what was it linked to? The fact that they were forgiven. The fact that he wasn't looking at them based on their poor conduct, their sins, their poor decisions, the things that they had done that were wrong. He wasn't looking at that. He wasn't seeing that. He wasn't beholding that. He was focused on what Jesus, their king, had done for them. And he links that to the fact that he will bless them. And nothing can reverse his stance to bless and love and give his people victory. But if you don't believe that you're forgiven, that you're loved, if you feel guilty, if you don't believe that your account has been reconciled and God is not imputing sin to you, then you will open yourself up to the enemy. That's actually how the enemy gets you. He goes about as a roaring lion. And the, roar, the lion's roar, according to the book of Proverbs, when, when he says when God is angry, it's like the roar of a lion. So what does the devil do? He goes around and he wants you to believe that God is angry with something you have done. That he is focusing on it. He is dealing with you after it. And this is why this is happening. And if he can get you to believe that, he can devour you. He goeth about as a roaring lion, doing what? Seeking whom he may devour. How can he devour people today? When they believe that God is angry with them, 
because of some sin in their lives or some past sin that they have committed. And as long as he can get you to believe that, he will devour you. Just like Israel, as long, when, the moment they switch the truth of God's goodness, the moment they exchanged the truth of God's goodness for a lie, they were destroyed. And he's doing the same tactic today. What are you believing about God that isn't correct? Are you believing that God is mad at you? Are you believing that God is angry with you? Are you believing that God is against you? Are you believing that you've done things to displease God and now he is no longer pleased to bless you, to protect you, to heal your body, that somehow, some way he is disappointed with you? You know, disappointment is a very strong word. It's a compound word. And it means the, the prefix dis and then appointed. Appoint, appointed, of course, would mean an appointment, a time, a place you're supposed to be. Dis, the prefix dis means you haven't arrived there. So disappointed means that you have, maybe you're not where you should be. And you feel like by now I should be further. By now I should have this out of my life. By now, I shouldn't still be struggling with this. And you feel like God is disappointed because you're not where you should be. God loves you. And believing those things actually keep you where you are. Never ever tell your children, parents, never ever say, I'm disappointed in you. Don't ever say that. Uh, husbands, don't ever say to your wife, I'm disappointed. Don't ever use that word. All is well. All is well. I want to pray with you tonight. I appreciate you staying on with me tonight. I want to pray with you. If you're dealing with Shame, guilt, fear. Because you know that you haven't made all the right choices. Maybe you're dealing with wrong belief. You don't realize how good God is. You're believing incorrectly about God. You feel like you've done too many things. You've got too many L's stacked up. I just want to pray with you tonight that God would help you to see how He sees you. If that's you tonight, go ahead and write in and say, Pastor, agree with me in prayer. Father, I thank you for these, your precious children. These are your sons and your daughters. And you love them. You're not disappointed in them. You're not frustrated with them. You love them. Father, maybe they've made some poor choices and they feel guilty. And they're believing the wrong thing about who you are. They don't realize that their sin account, their sin balance has been paid for. They don't realize that there is Nothing they owe you. I'm asking you right now.
to open the eyes of their understanding and help them to see who you are and how much you love them and what you have done for them in Christ Jesus. Help them to be established in the truth of the gospel so that your heart, your determined heart of blessing us can manifest. And I thank you for this. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Thank you for being a part of the service. Thank you for receiving the word of God. I love all of you. I'm so thankful for each and every one of you. And I trust that your days are getting better and better, brighter and brighter. And that all that God has for you will come to pass as you trust him. And as you recognize his true heart toward you. And all of this, the, the, the good things we talked about today, it's going to help you to rise up. It's going to help you to get where you're supposed to be. We're not saying stay the same. We're not saying stay back. We're not saying don't press toward the mark. No. But what we are saying is recognize that God loves you. He's not angry with you. He's not judging you critically. Let him bring you to your destination. Amen. I love you all so much. I'll see you on Sunday. Uh, we're going to continue our series on the gospel. Part four this Sunday. It's going to be great. So make sure you're tuning in. If you're uh, online, go ahead and tune in at 1015. We'll be streaming live. If you live here in the Tampa area, the Wesley Chapel, the new Tampa area, go ahead and join us for service right here. Uh, Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. at Wiregrass Ranch High School. All of our members, our, our active attendees, go ahead and bring a friend. Invite someone to come to church with you this Sunday and let them hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and let them begin to rise up when they hear from the one who cannot lie that his heart is so good toward them and that his love for them is so strong that it will rescue them from any situation. Help me to get the gospel out. Amen. Amen. I love you so much. Have a great rest of your night and a great rest of your week. And I'll see you Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for service. God bless you.